So uh, welcome, Dr. Dr. Rick Haney, um, who is soon to be a free man, I heard as well. That's what I hear. Yeah. yeah. So um, I when I when I had heard about the Haney test and this, oh, my God, all the cool people are doing at this Haney test. I thought Haney must be like Albrecht or, you know, or um, I don't know, one of those one of those people who had been alive a long time ago. And lo and behold, he's 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 still 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 alive and doing great work. And uh, it is it is prime. So you've, um, you know, been taking the concept of soil testing from the mineralogical analysis of how it had historically been done to a much more biological framework, which I think is your topic for today and how we can unposit some of our previous perhaps misconceptions and, and learn and grow. So um, I'll let you take it away and um, we'll have a question and answer in about an hour or so. Any, okay. Uh, all right. Let me see if I can get my screen shared here. There it is. Can you see that all right? We can see that. Okay. Well, it's pretty strange uh, for me. I'm sitting in a the upstairs of a farmhouse uh, in western Oklahoma right now there, that I used to work for this guy 40 years ago on the farm. And so, and then I'm going to retire at the end of June. And so I kind of come full circle. So it's pretty interesting that I'm sitting here right now doing this and, and going to talk about soil testing and, you know, a little bit of the journey I was on. But uh, this first slide, as you can see, my, my graphic design person was hired away from me. That's my wife, Liz. And uh, so I had to make my own, you know, first slide. So, you know, you can see how adept I am at that. This is, uh, I'm going to go back to on, with the Wayback Machine because this is uh, a quote that I, I gave in uh, graduate school when I got out of graduate school with my PhD. And I, <laughs> the evolution of CO2 from re, re dried soil because nobody believed you could do that and that it meant anything back, you know, in the 90s. And so that was the first slide, my opening slide of my, my talk when I got out of graduate school that in the beginning there was dirt and in the dirt there were microbes and it was good. And then it rained. Because the point of that was, you know, people will say, well, you can't take soil and dry it, grind it, and re-wet it because that's that's not natural. Well, yeah, it is. Every time the soil dries out in the field and it rains, you know, that's you get a flush of CO2. So, you know, it's a, it was a natural process that I thought they were really overlooking. And so I'm I'm gonna go through a little bit of introduction and history here and I'll and I'll get through it just bear with me because I think some of this is important but uh, the main component of all of this is that those the microbes in our soil re require organic carbon for growth and energy okay that's yeah and they oxidize and generate they oxidize carbon and generate co2 and that's really important they need oxygen as an electron receptor just like we do so you think about you know, we breathe in oxygen and give off CO2. This is the same thing the microbes do. They, they do this and they couple this with production. And they, but what they're really trying to do is reproduce themselves. And so it's important to understand that, they're, that the soil is a living thing and it's constantly dynamic and constantly in flux. So it's very difficult to capture some of those pathways that we really don't understand yet. So my job is to try to mimic nature in the lab as best that we could. And I've always trusted nature because, you know, nature's been doing R&D for millions of years. So, you know, they, they might be ahead of us on a couple of things. But when I, when I was doing my dissertation, I was just so surprised that when I went back, there's a whole lot of references from these years. Uh, it, you know, back in 1896, they were starting to understand that organic compounds were in soil and they get oxidized. And then these guys started saying, well, wait a minute, there's, there's CO2 coming off these soils, as well as ammonium and nitrate formation. And they're parallel processes of a biological nature because they didn't know that, these, uh, that all this chemistry was actually biologically driven. And, and so here we are 100 years later, I mean, 100 years later, really starting to dig into it and, and think about it. And then this fella in 1924, I believe he was Russian, noticed that his soil that had been dried and rewetted was more fertile than his soil that he kept filled most all the time. 
And that is a really key understanding. And, and you know, nobody believed what he was saying back then. And, and, but the whole process of nutrient cycling is a drying and rewetting process. It's not this steady state flow of nutrients that we think happens. It's drying and rewetting. It's very dynamic. And so this is a little uh, graph that my wife put together for me. And, and to show that, you know, 1905, 1934, 1949, you know, soil respiration has been studied for a long time. And just, they just we just never really did anything with it. They, they were starting to understand that, uh, you know, plant roots, that certain chemicals come out of plant roots. This is back in the, you know, 1920s, 1890s, 1910s. You know, my great grandfather, farms not very far from where I'm sitting right now and he used legumes as a source of in back in his day because they grew mostly cotton in western Oklahoma and so these are not necessarily new concepts they're just concepts that we haven't really adapted or you know tended to believe so you know we could go on forever in some of this stuff because it's just it's just amazing that you know a hundred years ago these folks really were seeing something is happening here there's there's a lot more going on here and they had plate counting you know, had pretty primitive methods for measuring this stuff but they were saying these wildly different numbers like the rise of sphere of wheat you know they found 653 million estimated bacteria and you know and only 22 million in in the control soil so they were clearly seeing that something was going on this a living root of the ground was a dynamic system and it affected the microbial community and you know something was really happening here that was very exciting to these folks because if you if you read some of these papers from way back then you could see the excitement in their voice and it was it really was eye-opening for me and i i, I pulled these two out because i thought this was interesting that this fellow said you know for purposes of agriculture it's better to evaluate microbial activity rather than population and that was an aha moment for me also because i thought well yeah have a whole bunch of microbes and only a few of them active versus a few that are all active i mean that you know that's a, that's a kind of a game changer in how you think about how the system works and then he went on to state that co2 evolution from soil was a better estimation or more pertinent than using plate counts which is you know, just letting them grow and you know so throughout my career i was these are the these are the things that i went that I look to, to, to help guide me toward what should I do? And then in 1935, they saw the sequence of microbial groups that, so now it's like, wait, it's not just one set of microorganisms. There's a whole bunch of them. And so the light bulbs start to come on and that, and this one right here really caught my eye. Cause he said, CO2 evolution was the greatest the first day after they rewetted the dried soil. And that's stuck in my brain somewhere. And then later, you know, develop some methods for it. But, that that just really blew me away. You know, that was like 90 years ago, and they saw it. 90 years, and then what happened to us? You know, they were they were seeing all this CO2 worked. You know, as the as the bacterial numbers fluctuated, the CO2 fluctuated, and then they started to, to tie carbon and nitrogen together, and figure out that this is a biological system and not a chemical action. Another breakthrough in '56. I mean, this. Stuff was just unheralded at the time, and, and I I have a big fan of history anyway, so this stuff was all very fascinating to me. And then this fellow Burst, he was a, a U.S. scientist, and he he started to really dig into this drying and rewetting flush, and figured out that, that it, when the soil dries out, these spores, these bacteria start producing these spores and fungi, and that's and it follows this uniform flush. So this is something that's consistent, and then he started to tie that, wait a minute, this is actually happening in the field, and maybe our laboratory measurements are underestimating field conditions, and that's another big breakthrough moment for me, because, you know, the thought I had was, well, if we can't mimic what's happening in the lab, or in the field, in the lab, then what are we really measuring? You know, how does that really make sense? How, how do we apply that? And so, from all this history stuff, I, I really started to think differently about how how do we do soil testing and why are we doing it the way we are so in 1970s <laughs> I, I i presented this years ago at a, at a deal and i said the british and others set back soil microbiology at least 40 years 
and introduce the art of confusion. You can't use the flush of CO2. It's not realistic. You have to use field moist soil. And, and, and that's when things really change from a focus from CO2 evolution, in other words, a dynamic measurement of soil activity, microbial life, something called soil microbial biomass carbon, which is just a measure of the mass of the microorganisms. It doesn't have anything to do with activity or how dynamic it is. And that, that kind of derailed the whole CO2 evolution uh, journey back then. I'm in graduate school. Dr. Alan Franz Liver showed me, he and I were both in grad school together, and he showed me this relationship on a spreadsheet that he thought existed between CO2 that we capture in 24 hours versus that same soil that we capture in 24 days. And that was very eye opening. So we started doing that and wrote a paper. And it was my first attempt. I was a farm boy off the farm from Oklahoma going to grad school. You know, very naive, even, even, even worse than now, if you can believe that. But my first attempt at publishing, showing this technique where you can dry and re-wet a soil and get a flush of CO2 and estimate nitrogen mineralization, completely rejected. And the reviewer said, that is too simple. You can't do that. That was, their, that was my introduction to academic publishing. And, you know, I put in here, Haney becomes emotionally disturbed because that's, that's true. I was about ready to, you know, I wanted to quit. It's like, what? Too simple. When, when has too simple been bad? So in, back then, I was a <laughs> young man and, you know, and I really started, this guy really, really made me mad. And we were at this ASA conference in Baltimore and he was a pretty soul scientist and, I, and he got all upset. And mad at me, and and then then my mind started playing with you know maybe we should have full contact science. I I was so upset, but what I didn't understand at the time was that we were pushing the, the long held beliefs of this is how soil works, and we were we were you know pushing on that envelope a little bit. And boy, they that 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 taught me a lot about people, and and you know are we interested in how this deal works or how we think it works? You know like. It was a very eye-opening thing for me back in the 90s. So Dr. Fromm, Livers, and I started publishing a bunch of papers showing all these relationships, this flush of CO2 and how it relates to all these other things. You know, basal soil respiration is just after the flush, it's just steady state. Well, it was still related. You know, it flushed out big. It would have a higher respiration steady state rate. I mean, it all started to tie together. It was related to bio microbial biomass, carbon, nitrogen. You know, these things were just amazing. I thought that we were going to just change the world. And we started looking at some of these methods, and they just didn't line up with respiration. And that was kind of our go-to thing. If, if these methods for microbial biomass in the soil did not match up with respiration, something was wrong. And so we published a bunch of papers uh, about those relationships. And, and, and boy, a lot of people didn't really, didn't really like us. So here we are, I'm thinking about all this. It's like, well, how do we test soil right now? Well, we test it as a non-living, non-integrated system, which none of that's right. We focus on physical and chemical measurements because they're pretty easy. We've ignored the biological aspect of soils for, well, up until the 60s, they didn't, but after the 60s, they quit, they started ignoring it. And then we extract soil with chemistry that soil never sees, and, and we all talk about. We also measure the house and not the food, and I'll we'll discuss that a little bit. So there's kind of an overview of, of how we've been doing it for a long time since the '60s, '70s, you know, up until recently, and it, that that just never really struck me as being right. And so then come here comes along soil health, right? It was a paradigm shift. People really get upset about some of the old timers like me would get upset about the word soil health because they say, you know, it's like, well, we've been doing soil quality measurements forever. It's like, well, yeah, but quality and health are two different things that strike people different. Health, people understand health better than they do quality. So it really is a living system and the soil really is healthy and or not healthy. And that that was a shift in the in the way we think. And so it's really been fun to watch. Uh, this shift progress. 
And one of those key things is it, I've always been a huge fan of nature. And from observation, you know, we know that nature grows the skin on living systems, be it a fish, an eagle, a, you know, a pasture, you know, any, anywhere. It, it grows, it puts skin on living systems and it cycles nutrients, it's diverse, it doesn't do monoculture, it tries to balance itself and it tries and it sustains itself. You know, nobody was fertilizing the, the prairie when the bison were on it, you know, back in the 20s and and before you know in the 1860s nobody was out there throwing fertilizer so and yet we had this incredibly fertile uh prairie in the midwest and so you know the system worked and then what what do we do so we come along and first thing we do is strip soil skin off just right away let's do that which destroys organic matter causes erosion we have to use more inputs and it, it, it's not very efficient with water which water is going to, and you mark my word, someday water, we're, there's going to be war fought over water if we don't start doing a better job uh, of using it uh, efficiently. So, you know, this, so you look at these dynamics of, of how, how the system was and how the system is now, and they're radically different. And so water is the key. I mean, if we, when it rains, if you can't get the water in your soil, then it's just a problem. If it goes in your soil, everything's good. If it runs off your soil, now you've got a problem. And so the analogy I was had was, you know, when you go to the bank, you just take your money and throw it at the teller of the window and hope some of it sticks, you know, and why would we do that with our fields? We, we want all that water to go in the soil, not off of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to show you a little bit of data that was done on farm trials, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, by the Illinois Fertilizer and Chemical Association uh, back in the 2000s. This was such interesting data. <coughs> Sorry, that I wanted to show it <coughs> to you. <coughs> Goodness. Of course, I didn't bring you water. Anyway, these are nitrogen rates and yield. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, I got to take a breath here. <laughs> All right, so. <clears throat> Dan, you might have to help me for a minute. <clears throat> All right, I'm back. Okay, so this is in rate corn yield before and after soybeans. I always ask farmers, what do you see? And they say, well, you have an increasing rate of nitrogen and higher yield. What we were after in our type of soil testing is this right here. You're getting almost 100 bushel corn yield with no fertilizer. The test that I developed is trying to identify that pool of nitrogen, not this out here. <coughs> we wanna see what this soil is capable of on its own with no fertilizer. As we know, fertilizers aren't very efficient. Their use, their use efficiency is not very high. So this is what we were after. Here's another one. After, this is corn after soybean. You see it's a little more than 100 bushels. So obviously the legumes really had an impact on that nitrogen availability in that soil. Because this is no fertilizer. So this... People say, well, your test isn't calibrated. It's like, well, no, not to the traditional. It's calibrated to that right there. This is what we're after so that we can reduce our input costs based on some of this information. So if you look at this graph, and this is really good data, it's corn yield here, rates of nitrogen here. And so the zero plot made it anywhere from a little above 50 to over 150. <clears throat> I'm fighting this cold, so I'm, I'm trying to get through this, but what I want you to notice, your take-home message here is that look at the variation of all these different end rates. When you send your soils off to a soil testing lab, they will give you back, well, if you got this much nitrogen, we recommend this much fertilizer. What they're going off of is this line right here. What you'll never see is the variation in those numbers. So it's not... It's not as an exact science as it might seem. There's a lot more wiggle room going on here. I mean, we're looking at 140 bushel to almost 250 bushel on the same end rate. 
and these are all fields in Illinois, so they're not that far apart. So the point I'm trying to make is nature is very dynamic, and we, we act like we have it nailed down with an exact science, and we really don't. So that's really the only point I'm trying to make there. This is some of the uh, soil testing data the universities have come up with showing, you know, in rates that, you know, it's, it's just really scattered. This is, these are yields of corn versus in rates, total known, you know, there's no strong relationship there. I mean, come on, but you know, when you, when they run the calculations, they use that line right there. So, but what you don't ever see is all this scatter. So I think we could be more honest about it and say, look, we, you know, it's a dynamic system. We're trying to learn more about it. We'll get better at this. You know, we're going to do better soil testing methods and try to, to get better numbers to you. And folks ask me all the time, it's like, well, you know, you're, as I said, your test isn't calibrated. And, I, and my answer is, well, apparently the, the tests we use now are calibrated to the dead zone of the Gulf because, you know, we have this enormous dead zone in the Gulf because of too much fertilizers washed down the rivers in the water basin. And so this is just absolutely unacceptable. We should never do this. This, this We've got to do better than this for the, our farmers and ranchers, for our, the people, for the water quality. I mean, we, you know, this is a red flag and something that really points out that we have got to be better and more efficient with our resources. You know, I've asked a lot of folks that, you know, because the soil testing methods that we use mostly nowadays are 50, 60, 70 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old. And how many of you are walking around with a rotary dial phone in your pocket? You know, that's the soil test methods we've been using. And versus, you know, that's a paradigm shift to communication right there. And so we want to kind of drag the soil testing industry into the 21st century, so to speak, and try to adopt new methods and look at different things and look at the soil from a different perspective. So the soil health tool, you know, my approach was ask the soil three questions. What's your condition? Are you advanced? What can we do to help? I mean, instead of us getting soil in there, beating it up in the lab to get whatever, you know, answer we want, let's look at it from the soil's perspective and what, what's really going on. So from nature's perspective, you know, we're not trying to mimic how the soil responds. We are trying to mimic how the soil responds in the field after it rains in the field, not, not how it responds to old lab methods. We want to know what happens to soil when it rains because that's where the ball game is. And so that's hence the drying and rewetting and the soil respiration. These are the folks we're after, the soil bacteria and fungi. They're, they're trying to talk to us if we'll just stop and listen and, and use different tools uh, in a different way to really try to understand how the system functions, it'll serve us well. I'm, I'm just a firm believer in that. Also, we have a hard time with some of this because it is such an incredibly dynamic system. And our statistics and our understanding is more or less based on linear situations where, you know, X does Y and, it, and you can count on it over and over, but that's just not how it works. It's a very dynamic system and we're going to use new tools to try to capture that dynamic system and so in a way that we can start to understand what we're looking at. So some of these new methods that are coming out, you know, the test I developed, PLFA, you know, some of the DNA analysis, you know, we're in the beginning of this. The, the standard soil test has been around for, you know, 60 years. We're, we're just in the beginning of changing how we look at this. So it's going to take a little time and some education, and, and we're all going to learn this together. And I, I, I've always used this simple little graph because, you know, it takes oxygen and water, soil microbes, they give off CO2, as well as plant available nitrogen and phosphorus, and these things are coupled together. So this was one of the very important things that I, I just thought was going to change the world back in the early 90s and then, you know, found out that not everybody believed like I did. So, it, it, you know, but it's always been my driving force because, I, you know, it's a fairly simple system and, you know, we've got to get it down to something we can understand. So this is really fun. You know, I already told you that I, my first attempt was rejected to, you know, I got upset. Well, here's the fun part about this. We were doing a, a a 24-hour CO2 capture with, with chemicals. So it was a titration thing. What I didn't tell them is that we can actually do it with an infrared gas analyzer in just a few hours and figure out 
the nitrogen mineralization in 30 days. So what was fun to me about this is that, you know, they thought this was too simple. We, it's what we already had in our back pocket was something even simpler, which they weren't even ready for. So that was kind of fun for me, but we were seeing this. So this is CO2 in one to six hours versus 30 days of incubation. The, the same soils, the CO2 captured and it, it, it took 30 days to reveal. We could capture that in a few hours to separate these treatments. It, it was absolutely mind blowing to me. And I thought, wow, what a cool thing, what a simple thing nature's given us as a tool to help us understand how healthy our soil is, how our management impacts it, and what we can do with it. I mean, I was just so excited, and it's been over 20 years to get all this developed, and, and, and some acceptance is starting to build. It, it's been quite the journey. These are important points. Soil drying and rewetting, that's where the majority of nutrient cycling happens, is the drying and rewetting re -wetting effect. And all of our laboratory analysis doesn't account for that. And I had, uh, I've got a seven-year-old and 11-year-old daughter. And I was, I was asking them the other day, I said, you know, it's how it turns green after it rains. And they were like, yeah. And I said, why is that? And they were like, well, because it rained, dad, you know, dork. And I said, no, it's actually the release of nitrogen and phosphorus. That, because if you want to green something up, you know, if you add nitrogen fertilizer to it, it usually greens up, gets darker, right? So when it rains and it's been dry and you see all your plants or your fields or whatever get darker green, that's because of all that organic nitrogen that gets released by the microbe. That's, you know, that's a, something we don't really think about. But that we're, we're actually seeing that dynamic effect in the field and don't really realize it. So what I was trying to do was mimic nature as best that I could. So I use water as an extract because that's what it rains. It rains that water, I'm pretty sure. And we looked at nitrogen, C to N ratios, soil respiration. You know, I developed my own soil extractant, which is based off plant root exudates. And so we look at some of these minerals with that because that's what kind of what a plant root sees. So it was a very different approach to the standard set of tests. Uh, and it's been, it's been, as I said, quite the challenge. But to show a, a simple deal, my wife made this for me because, you know, she didn't think I was smart enough to really under, explain it. So, you know, rain clouds, we use a water extraction for carbon and nitrogen. And then we use, uh, here's the respiration. And then we have ammonium and nitrate, which the, they do with the standard test. We also do that. So we, we measure water extractable nitrogen, total nitrogen. And water, and water extractable organic carbon on one machine. So we're gonna break this bond up and look at this stuff. And then we also, uh, same sample, we measured the inorganic nitrogen. And so the difference between these two is water extractable organic nitrogen. And that's where we get a C to N ratio. So it's, it's a pretty simple, straightforward thing, but a different way to think about it. We do, so every soil that gets sent to my lab, we would, we would do one of them, extract it with water, extract the other one with uh, H3A, the stuff I came up with. It's a 10 minute shake, four grams of soil, 40 mils of water, so a 10 to one ratio. And then we would centrifuge it and filter it and then off to the machines it goes. It's a, it's a pretty simple process. And then we run the water extract for carbon and nitrogen, ammonium, phosphate and nitrate and then we run the h3a extract for all this stuff so the fun thing is we have cross checks here so our total nitrogen better be more than our ammonium and nitrate better be higher right our orthophosphate better be lower than our total phosphate on an icp so we have these nice cross checks that are just naturally built into the system to check that make sure the data looks right then we did something different. We integrate all this information into these different pools. And so we don't just measure one thing and say this, like we don't measure just nitrate nitrogen and say, here's your nitrogen. We measure a lot of things. But the integration of the data was really helpful. We also don't do uh, organic matter. I think that's a great measurement. I like organic matter. We just don't do it. Because to me, the organic matter is the house that the microbes live in. But what we're interested in is the carbon that's water extractable, organic carbon, because that's the food they eat. 
that's what they actually see. They don't see all this enormous amount of carbon in the house. They see these floating molecules in the water. That's their actual food. So we're looking a little bit deeper down inside of it. To illustrate that, here's some different organic matter contents from Maine, Wyoming, Idaho, and Texas. You can see there's a nice stair step down um, results. And when we look at water extractable on the same, we still see this, but you know, this one fell. So, you know, that kind of stuff was eye opening back. Like, well, why does this have less of the water soluble carbon than this one? But then when we run uh, CO2 respiration, in other words, the living portion of the soil on the same soils, it looks just exactly like that graph before. So this is the food that they see, and that's how they react. That looks just like that. And that, that was very eye-opening to us that microbial activity is a very important indicator of what's going on. And to give you another example, this is organic. So this is soil organic carbon. And so you're actually measuring the carbon and nitrogen in the soil itself as a combustion. This is the same soils done with water track, you know, and, you know, look at the axis difference. So the organic in is zero to 5,000 part per million and here it's zero to 80, zero to 1,200, zero to 50,000. So huge pools of carbon and nitrogen, much smaller pools, but almost an identical slope in their relationship uh, when we do a water extract. So this is a subshot of that big pool. So this is what the microbes are after. This is their house. This is the food they have in it. So the, the extract, this was the question, what does a plant root really see? Well, it sees water in a complex mixture of root exudates with enzymes and nutrients. And I believe that this is just such an elegant system and it just flows. And there's a, there's a show on, I believe it's Netflix called uh, Intelligent Trees. If you ever get a chance to watch that, to really open your eyes about the impacts of the fungi and how they interact with plant roots, it's just absolutely amazing. But we have been extracting the soil with very acidic or alkali solutions and have been calling it plant available, but that's not what these guys do. So, the basis of the extract was to try to mimic what a plant root is. Because this is where the game is. I mean, to me, this is liquid sun. This is this is photosynthate coming out of the plant root, tip of the plant root. This is all microbial food. They work in conjunction with each other. You know, sunlight drives this entire system. And, you know, this is just where the game is. So you've got this feeding system you know, a symbiotic relationship, and we really need to help try to nurture that uh, in our farming and, and ranching. So to give you an example, phosphate, current labs have two different machines and up to seven different extracts. If you ever send multiple samples to different labs and you get different numbers, that, that's probably why. They might not all be using the same machine or they might be using different extracts. So, because they give you a little bit better, different numbers. So that's an explanation. That's why you might see that sometimes. We run both machines and we look at uh, all these combinations things. We run both machines, you use the extract I developed. We take into account respiration, the organic seed end ratio, you know, phosphorus mineralization. We, we look at many, many things before we say you've got this or that. We do the same thing with nitrogen. Now, what shocked me years, you know, 20 years ago when I was really looking at soil testing is how many labs in the country and around the world don't test for nitrogen at all. They would just put out all the nitrogen and call it good. So that was back when fertilizer was cheap, and it's not anymore. So, again, we look at the inorganic fraction, the total fraction, the organic fraction, how the soil respiration fits in. So there's a lot of calculations that go into what we say is plant available. So what we found early on that was really interesting was that we've been missing half the nitrogen for all this time because all we've ever measured is inorganic nitrogen. And, you know, there's more, there's at least half, if not more, in the organic fraction that the microbes are going to release to the soil that we're not accounting for at all. So we've been missing half the nitrogen since 1965 at least. And so this is, you know, this is a hard pill to swallow sometimes for, for 
folks because it's changing, it's different. And, you know, it's just, it's a difficult transition to try to understand that, you know, we might be over fertilizing. We might could do a better job with this with some of these new methods. And so it's a risk and it's, it's difficult to take that choice sometimes, but, you know, it might be necessary in the future. This is the only form of nitrogen we usually tested for with the standard test. And we've ignored all these organic compounds, organic nitrogen compounds, and they're everywhere in the soil. So we're trying to capture some of those with our uh, looking at organic nitrogen. And we'll give you a quick illustration. So this is the nitrogen that we find in the, the green bar. This is just nitrate nitrogen by itself. So this is what we find. This is the difference that we find. I mean, this is 60 pounds, 70 pounds. You know, this one's not too much. It's 15, 18 pounds, but you know, it varies, of course. But the point being, there's there's more nitrogen here than we're giving credit for. So we 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 might want to rethink some of our recommendations. Same thing for phosphate. You know, when we this is actually some of my fields, and as I transitioned away from using fertilizer. Uh, to using cover crops. And you can see how there was hardly any organic phosphorus because we were giving it all the inorganic phosphorus. So the organic P was very low. This is an, from an extract. But as we went through time in these fields, you know, it started to transition. It got low and lower and lower. And now here's the fun part. We were making the same yield when we had this much fertilizer out as when we had this much fertilizer out because this organic fraction was starting to build. And we never lost any yield when we weaned ourselves off uh, phosphate fertilizer, which is really interesting. These are some of the results that we show. Uh, I did my lab, I, I say did, because uh, June 1st is the cutoff date. We, we won't be analyzing samples for people anymore because I'm retiring June 30th. So but these are some of the results that we sent out. Uh, this was the microbial activity. So what we ended up trying to show is here's the activity, here's the food they see, here's the nutrition they see, the balance of the food and nutrition, which is the seed-in ratio, and so then we gave a soil health calculator. We also break down the nitrogen in the water extract into the inorganic and organic food. So in what's really, this is one of the very first indicators when farmers switch to a regenerative system. They're like, well, how many years does it take? Generally speaking, when, when if a farmer goes from a conventional till system to a no-till cover crop system, this is the first thing that we see start to change. This, these farms are well on their way. There's more nitrogen in the organic form than the inorganic form. And that's what you want. This can go away. This is going to stay. But <clears throat> when we see the switch, generally after the first year, you know, we start to see these numbers move. Like, if you just made your switch, this might be 81 pounds total. This would probably be 50 and this would be 30. But then after the first year, you might see that they're almost, you know, 40. 40. That's, that's, a, that's a very sensitive little indicator that, that tells us you're on the right track. We also have a little calculator built in here. If you want to do a fertilizer recommendation based off the numbers we find, that was that's all built in. To the system and we did this which was fun because we started taking the nutrients in your soil from your soil analysis and multiplying it times current fertilizer prices give you a value of what the, the nutrients you have in your soil right now in a dollar value and the farmers really liked that because they just didn't realize you know that, that there was value in their soil you know just naturally so that was kind of, of a fun thing to do to give you that uh, Example, this is Yogola 200 bushel corn. This soil had a soil health score of eight. This one had a soil health score of 26. And so if you only did nitrate nitrogen, that they had the same amount of nitrogen, 20 pounds, 20 pounds. We found a lot more in this than here, on this, on this good soil than this good soil. So long story short, the end recommendation here was 180 pounds to grow 200 bushel corn, and it was 100 pounds here. <laughs> and they both hit their yield bush, their goal. So, you know, does soil health matter? Yes, it's, it's money in your pocket. Cover crops were the missing link. When we first started just doing no-till, we just did no-till and it just didn't really work for us very well. 
when we introduce cover crops into that into a rotation with our cash crops, then it started to click. And that was really eye-opening for me to get the news because we had 150 acres of research land that I farmed. And boy, that so to see it on your own deal is is priceless. Farmers just need to see it on their happen on, on their fields. Because plants fix dirt and make soil. You know, this the game, this is a plant root. The microorganisms are all around it. You know, this that's where the game is. And and let the plants, let the cover crops start fixing that soil. If if you give good things to the soil, it'll give something back to you. It's, this, this is a cover crop mix that we've used for years. It worked really well in our area. And I really recommend any farmer rancher out there that to get it, start using cover crops if you can. This is an enormously complex system, you know, how photosynthesis works, but think about how you're capturing sunlight and putting that energy into the soil for all the organisms and the plants to use. I mean, it's just a, it's an unbelievably complex system that we, we just kind of take for granted. So you might say, which one of these fields captures more solar energy? Well, obviously this one, that one is not capturing anything. It's just sitting there. So having a living root in the ground is very important. We did this little study a couple of three years ago, just for fun. So there's a picture of some of the sunflower roots. <coughs> That's more of a close up of how intricate the root system is. There are some sorghum roots. And what we did is we pulled up several sunflower plants and shook, and so the dirt that came off, that came with the root, we shook that off into a bag. And we did that enough times, pulled enough plants and shook that off into a bag we had a sample and what we were looking for is what's the soil like right around the root so we did that with sunflower sorghum and then we took a bulk sample that didn't have either one i'm growing next to it and look at the difference the respiration is way higher in the sunflower sunflowers are native in central texas and so you can see that the difference between those two plants versus the bulk soil so that soil right around the root really tells you something. And so the carbon was higher, the respiration was higher, of course the soil score was higher. They really like this carbon, you know, in the sunflower versus the sorghum and the bulk soil. And the nitrogen, the inorganic nitrogen was down because the plant was taking it up, but it had a bigger reservoir or organic nitrogen where the sunflower was. So, you know, it really opened our eyes as to how we, we were going to start thinking about soil. Uh, I hate taking soil samples, but what I do now is go pull plants and take the dirt off of it because that looks at what's happening right around the root. And that is really where the game is. So I get this question, what can we do? Well, we can put the skin back on the soil using no-till, cover crops, you know, be innovative and tenacious. And that's what nature is. Nature is innovative and tenacious. We have to be that way as best we can. You know, and, and if we're not lacking in innovation. This is a robot that's spreading cover crop seeds between this, these corn rows, you know, while it's still growing. I mean, so the idea there, so they harvest that corn, the cover crop's already growing and they don't have to go in there and plant. I mean, this, this is the kind of innovation we're after. This is a machine I developed with, a, with my Dr. Mike White. And this is, this is a capture CO2 uh, after we incubate the soil samples that we get in. This is a bigger version. These are many versions of this, of this. And so, you know, we're trying to be innovative for this kind of stuff. There's the sample right there. I actually hooked, I built five of these and hooked them all to one sample just to make sure they were all doing the same thing. And so they were, but you know, this is the kind of fun stuff we get to do, you know, come up with a way to do this accurately and economically. And, you know, I just, I love that kind of stuff. Here's a relationship between those two machines. This is the big, the big fancy lab machine versus the little mini cube. I mean, there, there's a very, very strong relationship between the two. So we're we're pretty comfortable with with either machine, uh, depending whatever a lab needs. And so, you know, again, this is just the kind of stuff that I really enjoy doing is is coming up with stuff that's that's our useful tools. So, in the end, working with nature is the key, not against it. You know. I mimic it well it's, it's ahead of us it understands these things it's balanced it conserves water you know let's let let's work with the earth and, and not against it 
I get this question a lot. No deal, conventional deal. My answer is plant the cover crops. You don't need a test or research to tell you how to help your soil. You, all, you already know that. Nature's been showing us all along. And I've met so many farmers and worked with so many farmers in my life. <clears throat> it's, it's hard to stay excited about anything if there's not innovation driving it. <clears throat> so this is my uh, field research. This is my conventional till field. My wife made this for me because I thought that was a nice visual. This is my no-till cover crop research field. If any of you know Gabe Brown and see any resemblance right here, that's not coincidence. Nature finds a way. These are little seed pods with little insects in them growing on a piece of rusty wire I found in my barn. I just That, that kind of stuff fascinates me. Why a piece of rusty wire in, right there? I, I, there's so much nature has to teach us, all we've got to do is start listening. And as one little teaser, I'm going to show you this. I've been working on this. This is the soil health calculation from the test I developed. I've come up with a nutrient density index. In other words, if you have the same soil health score as this person, the question I was having is how do we separate the same soil health score into a meaningful value? And what I've done here is looked at the organic fractions, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and come up with an index score that separates these. Because as Dan has told me, and Dan and I have discussed, uh, it's going to be hard to have a nutrient-dense food without a nutrient-dense soil, maybe. So part of that conversation with him was, was, was trying to come up with a way to, to do this. It's on about, I don't know, 3,500 samples. I've got more samples to, to run in a bigger database to see if this relationship holds. But this is something I'm pretty excited about. This is something that we can do, and I think this will help us uh, strive towards uh, having better soil. That's all I have. Thanks, Rick. Um, nice little teaser there at the end. <laughs> um, wow. Well, where to start? Um, <clears throat> people, I think, are know that there's the, the Q and A box, and we welcome welcome questions there. Um, usually, we go for a little bit longer, so maybe people aren't quite ready to start posting things. Um, are you able to turn your camera back on? I'm working. It'll be a couple. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Well, sorry, I didn't bring any water, of course. I'm fighting a cold, and yes, you know. I'm sorry. I, I was I I was uh, not able to <laughs> turn my That's camera fine. back on on my phone. I, anyway, um, you powered through it. Uh, uh, we have one one question here, Lynn. Uh, if Dr. Haney is retiring, will we still be able to use this test? Yes, uh, there are several commercial labs uh, that offer this test. Uh, some have kind of their own version of it versus the one that I have. But, uh, you know, once I uh, retire from USD, I'll be able to tell you which ones. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'll, you'll be able to tell us. <laughs> I'm still going to be around. I, I should say that, you know, I'm going to go to the private sector. It's not like I'm, I'm out of the game. I, that's, that's not going to happen. Well, Ray Ray left the NRCS and started, you know, doing a bunch of stuff. So I'm guessing, I mean, it, yeah. you would be doing something something similar. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I mean, it's such a deep conversation. This one about testing and what do we know and what's important to be able to assess. I don't know if you conveyed the soil health scores sufficiently. I mean, we had a couple interesting conversation a couple whenever it was we met in Kansas, I think. Um, yep. And you know, I was asking you about what the Haney test is and how it works and, you know, what your thoughts are about tillage and no-till and a lot of the people that are in the, you know, quote unquote, regenerative community are pretty dogmatic about tillage. And, and what I recollect you saying at least was something along the lines of, um, you know, every soil is unique and tillage may or may not be appropriate in certain circumstances. So, you know, to be so dogmatic as to say, thou shalt never disturb the soil, et cetera, et cetera, is not, um, is dogmatic. So yes, and it in at 10 years of research at the research center, I had conventional till and no till side by side. All right, every every 90 feet. Yeah. And but we always had cover crops planted in both. And here was the take home message from 10 years of research. In that soil, which is a Houston black, there was no difference after 10 years in the soil health score 
Now they had both come way up over the years because we've been using cover crops. But if you, as long as you keep the ground covered, you can do some tillage, and it'll. It, I, I'm never going to say tillage is always bad. I'm, I'm just not. Yeah. Because there are certain situations where you might need tillage. Nature's dynamic. Weather's dynamic. You might not always be able to get in and do what you need to do. This guy whose house I'm sitting in right now is a conventional till farmer. Not even all my life she's worked for him. That's what he did last year. He no tilled as we did. Yeah. Why? Because he couldn't get over his ground. And guess yeah. what? It worked. So, you know, we got to be flexible with our thinking. We got to be flexible with how we do things. And, you know, I, I just don't think we want to lock ourselves into one system or another. Uh, you can do conventional till uh, if you use cover crops and, and it's way better than not. I'll say that. Yeah, no, it's, I, I've been around long enough now to sort of watch various um, isms come and go and sort of, you know, the no-till one has been fairly strong for a few years now. And it's just sort of gotten to the point where it's like, you know, anybody who tills at all is sort of feeling self-conscious and like, I don't think it's that way. <laughs> so. Well, I made, I made this statement in front of a bunch of people in an audience. I, I said, I would rather see a farmer uh, conventional till with cover crops than no till without them. And that's, that's about as clear as I can put it. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, keeping the soil covered as much as possible. I think, like you said, you don't need to do much testing to know that's a good thing to do. Right. What can you take home? The NRCS has been saying that for a few years now. Great. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to start reading some questions here that are starting to show up here. Uh, Dara asks, what implication does this have for home gardeners and useful testing? People are still oh. doing what they can for healthy carbon soil, even if it's just for grass and a dozen vegetables. That's a good one because I gave a, uh, by the way, Dan, this is the last webinar I'm giving while I'm employed at the USDA. So um, <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> I uh, didn't know, didn't know you were you're retiring when I asked you to do this, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't really either. So yeah. uh, I gave a webinar recently to a master, master gardener in Texas. And we went over the same principles. It's like it, whether you're a farm or a garden, these things work. And so I explained to them, and they were asking me, and I said, are you fertilizing your garden? And they were like, well, yeah. I said, well, you're doing it wrong. And yeah. oh, boy, you know, oh, that, that opened a can of worms. But, but they started to understand because my wife has a garden, and she uses cover crops. I mean, it, it, and chickens, and less chicken. Yeah. I mean, working with nature, and, and phenomenal yields and, and we can't give it all away you know and so it these same principles apply to the gardens as well as farm yeah i i think that's yes <laughs> i i did have one question about you know the assessments of different um trace elements i mean some people have been talking about i certainly have been one of them things like cobalt and molybdenum and sulfur and boron that may or may not be present in the soil or in sufficient quantities at least in the, in the root zone many of them being anions. I didn't yeah. see that in your assessment. Do no. You have, what thoughts do you have about things like that? Well, I shied away. We, we're now, right at the end, we were doing micronutrients in our, yeah. in our test, but I shied away from that because I thought it was going to be controversial enough to just focus on N, P, and K. Yeah. And so micronutrients are very, very important, but they're not as important as getting your carbon cycle right, your water cycle right, your nutrient cycle right once we start getting those things nailed down a little better then we can worry about some of the finer details but but is there a problem with mineral nutrition by because some of those are missing yes i'm yeah. sure there is so i mean the biodensity the nutrient dense stuff this this guy house i'm saying he has a garden every year and i said are your tomatoes better out of your gardener from downtown i said why do you think that is <laughs> and he's like well it tastes better it's like well i said well, what if the nutrients were denser in yours <laughs> he was like well, i don't know about that <laughs> but i said what if you had an instrument that would show you yeah you think you command a higher price for it the farmer's market and he's he, he liked that yeah and when that when that holy <laughs> grail is, is arrived at well uh <laughs> i think yeah a lot of people are going to want it but it is to do it to do it properly and scientifically is a uh, is certainly a bit of work, but I would say we're making good progress on that. Um, yeah. are, do you want to share more about the your nutrient density of soil or however you were framing that? Uh, not or yet. I'm, I'm so, 
Yeah. When I make a new calculation, what I do is I'll start with a 200 set database, right? 200 sample database. And then if I get it where I think it is, then I'll expand it to a 5,000 sample database. And then look, and I've got like a 45,000 sample database. So that's the acid test at the end. And yeah. I, I haven't got, I haven't applied it to that yet. Cause I, I really try to pick up the problems before I put, put something out there. So it's not quite ready yet. Well, we're looking forward to hearing what you. What it's going to be cool, think. though. It's a neat calculation. I, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued. You've been doing some interesting things for quite some time. Um, all right, Brian asks, uh, how would Dr. Haney compare his tests uh, with Solvita and Cornell? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, I like mine better. <laughs> um, uh, Solvita is interesting because uh, when I met Will Brinton, he was using Solvita paddles for compost. And I convinced him to make a new formula and uh, do it for soil. And then I did the research. And so mm -hmm. since then, uh, I've come up with uh, a cheaper and easier way to do it than Solvita, so, uh, which I was forced to kind of do. But uh, I think Solvita's is fine. Uh, but there, there's other ways to do it. I'll just leave that at that. Well, so we basically is for those who don't know is is testing respiration, right? I mean, yes. Then that's it. It doesn't do anything beyond respiration. Right. And right. what you're proposing, or what you, I don't know if it was emphasized sufficiently, was you put together a complete. You come with a soil health score, kind of like Cornell does, after you've factored in all these different metrics. Yeah, but, but it's my test better. was designed to say to cut back to account for N, P, and K that we. were well, my my test was designed around that. It's like if you've been putting again, on, you, you broke up for a second. Your your test designed around N P and K. Mm -hmm. So if you've been putting on two hundred pounds of nitrogen, and my test shows you can do it with one hundred and sixty, right? That, based on the organic stuff, that's what this test was designed for. NRCS really wanted some sort of index score mm -hmm. to go along with it. I came up with the soil health calculation, okay. and since it's kind of morphed into People are more interested in their soil health calculation than the NP and K savings. Right. My question is, or not question, but I don't care what your soil health score is. We can't show you guys that doing regenerative agriculture puts money in your pocket. What are we doing? So I don't get too caught up in soil health scores. I want to know, does this have an impact on a farmer's bottom line and make them more uh, efficient with their resources? Yeah. That's the biggest difference. And how is this different from what Cornell does? Uh, Cornell uses a lot of older methods uh, that there's not, you know, like they use uh, permanganate carbon, you know, oxidation for uh, carbon in the soil, right? That's a, that's a oxidizing agent. Uh, I use uh, rainwater and, you know, so it's, it's a harsh chemical versus water extract. So I don't see Cornell's test as really mimicking nature so much. Like for nitrogen, they use, I think, a uh, an autoclave. I don't see many autoclaves out in the soil very yeah. often. So I I don't have a knock against anybody. I'm just saying my the methods that I designed were based on what I believe nature was trying to tell us to. I'd say and that. And it's a constantly evolving conversation and you've hopefully yep. been able to offer something to the to the process. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um so uh, Roizen says, we are in a very wet, temperate maritime climate where soil doesn't really dry out during the growing season. What are the implications of this in regards to soil health and CO2 release? That's a good question. Yeah. Here's what I would say. Get some of that soil, dry it, re-wet really it, see what it does. Because you, you know, if it's constantly wet, because what we found is that when these soils are constant, so in theory, a soil that's constantly wet like that will, will get to some baseline soil respiration, right? It's just gonna keep putting CO2 out at a fairly steady state. And the mineralization of, of nitrogen and phosphorus, phosphorus should be fairly slow and steady, right? So that's that's a different system than where it gets dry and, and we rewet it and, and you get this flush of it. That's gonna be a different uh, size that we would have to uh, figure out how to measure better. If it was, you know what I mean? That's, a, that's where I would start. I would take some of that soil, send it to a lab that does this stuff, that they'll dry it, grind it, re-wet it, and see what happens. That, that'll give you an indication of 
what's happening in your soil because it's going to take X amount of microbes while it's constantly wet to maintain whatever nutrient cycling it's doing. And when, once we take that stuff and dry it and re-wet it, and let it blow back up, that should be relatively speaking uh, how fertile that soil is. I don't know if that made, it made sense in my head. I, yeah, I'm not sure that I didn't, I don't think I got it. So maybe other people didn't. Um, just to, to go back to what you were saying about the cycling of wet and dry. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a ongoing conversation amongst many people <laughs> forever about how often should you water your garden? Do you do a shallow, regular water? Do you do a deep, irregular water? Can you just go back to that, what you were saying at the beginning about the wet and the dry and the benefits um, and how you understand that? Yeah, well, our garden, we, we let it dry out, right? And when things start hitting their wilting point, when you can tell in Texas that it's really starting to suffer, We'll hit it with a little bit, and we we do it in the evening because if if we we found that if we water during the day, it's just evaporating, right? And it stresses the plant. Actually, it almost burns the plant when you got that sun bearing down on it, and you throw that cold water on it, it stresses it. So we wait till the sun goes down, or set the timer for overnight, and rewet mm -hmm. it, and in the morning it all looks way better. And we don't do. My wife will do a deep watering when she first gets things going. And after that, we kind of just dry it and rewet it when we think it needs it. We want, we, we, we kind of want plants to stress a little bit before we water them. Because I think that's how nature has developed, that stress. We, this farm I'm sitting on right now, we've observed many times over the years that when that wheat would get stressed a little bit, and then it would rain, it would come back bigger and stronger. And so we never put too much fertilizer out. We made it work for it, work for the nitrogen. You know, I think if you're an athlete, right? If you're going to, you're going to train and, and stress your body, right? To, to make it stronger. I don't think plants are all that dissimilar. I mean, this nature has a common theme running to it a lot of the time. So I don't know if that made Yeah, sense. no, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those, it's one of those questions I would say, you know, in nature, certainly you're not using fertilizer and probably you're not having a, mo a monoculture and probably you don't have a bare soil. And you, you know, at least if we can look at what things were like four or 500 years ago, it seems like there was a lot of organic matter in the soil. So I'm guessing in a natural environment, the likelihood of things getting dry particularly is, would be low in the first place. Um, so I don't know. Um, well, we had that drought several years ago here in Texas and Never forget the first half. I mean, it was it was over 100 degrees. I don't think it rained for 45 days. Yeah. And when it rained like one inch, we all ran out there, and you could smell the actinomycetes pumping out all these chemicals into the. It, it was just unbelievable how fast those microbes exploded. From yeah. a, I'll, Tell you one more. We found soil at, at another research station that had been on the, in a basement on a shelf for 65 years. They pulled soil samples from the same plots we had just pulled samples from and had been dried in 65 years. We brought those into the lab, re-wet them, and about 30% of them came back. CO2 yeah. respiration shot up. Yeah. You know, the other 70, just there, there was nobody left. But you talk about resilience. Well, the, I, I know I'm not. Much. I'm not disagreeing with resilience. I'm just saying what uh, what optimal is and and where we have the ability to put our fingers on the scale. With Roizen's question, you know, I mean, John Kemp, when he was speaking earlier at this conference, was talking about people maybe putting in a. Um, I think it was he was talking about um, um, tile, like or something like a tile, yeah. deep, a deep, you know. A, a, a pipe i'm not sure it was like every it wasn't very far apart it was five feet apart or something like that it was yeah. fairly close and, and maybe only at 18 inches but um you know when you do have excess water having a, str a strategy to facilitate removing it from the landscape um you know may be strategically valuable so yeah i'm seeing Roisins in ireland i think that name i, th I think i know that yeah but. there is there there is no one size fits all anything everywhere yeah yeah, we just got to get our, get away from that. I think. Yeah, um, and so uh, Bill and Jay ask: um, mycorrhizae and plant roots have a variety of ways of extracting nutrients. Do you use this range of extraction methods? 
and I'll just add on to that. I think you're probably familiar with with uh, James White's stuff with rhizophagy, and it looked like a couple of your slides didn't integrate. Oh yeah, he, he's exactly. fantastic. But we'll have him on here, I think, in a couple of weeks now. I'm not quite sure when exactly he's coming on. But yeah, he's he's very interesting. Um, yeah, what the range of the the the, the ways in which mycorrhizae and plant roots extract nutrients, does your method use all those compounds? No. Uh, I picked out, so I went through the literature and I picked out the three most cross, you know, used organic acids across a variety of plants. Because you could spend a lifetime trying to pick out all the ingredients that you would need to put the proper soil extract. I mean, you get multiple lifetimes. So I wanted to focus on the three major ones, get the system going, because understand that the methods that I developed were for, were for commercial soil testing labs to adopt. Yeah. So we've got, you know, it, it's not it's not like being in a research lab and coming up with whatever that never gets used, right? <laughs> this, this is USDA focused on the on the objectives of. Yeah. You know, it had to be better, better, but it still had to work in a, in a yeah. commercial setting. So, yeah. no, so I would love, if you have an idea of what that is, call me and we'll, we'll come up. <laughs> but you did use versions that, I mean, compounds, you said that were most, most uniform or most regularly used by biological systems. Yes, like malic acid, oxalic acid, and citric acid. That's the three that I, yeah. that I, used. I had a whole bunch more in it than that over the year. And yeah. I wrote four papers, there'd be four papers to get it there. So, yeah. Cool. All right, uh, Brian, um, uh, just a, an appreciation. Thanks, Dr. Haney, for highlighting various aspects of the soil health tests in the market. Your approach and cal calibration are great. Um, because soil microbial activity in situ by carbon, water, oxygen level, and temperature, um, do the Haney test measurements correlate to the, the same degree if sampled in fall, post-harvest, spring, pre-plant, with or without cover crop? So I'm sorry, you broke back. I didn't get all if, that. If you're taking if you're taking it the test in October and in April, um, do you get different results? I think is the basic question. Yes, yes, good. I'm glad that was asked because I had more people call me and say, "Well, we took this exactly what you just said. We took it in April. We took it in October. The numbers are different." I said, "Thank God." And that's not what the answer they're looking for. I said, "It's a dynamic system, right?" Because Some you're seeing say, how what the level of vitality is in the system right now. Yeah, and, based on how you treated it. Yes, and people want to know when do you pull a sample. Well, what do you want to know? Are you interested in the soil health, or are you interested in saving some NP and K on whatever cash crop you're about to do? So pull the sample before you put fertilizer out. Give your time, self time to get the results back and make the appropriate adjustments. If you're just interested in the soil health as aspect of it, pull them whenever you want when you want to know something. So yeah. there's no hard and fast rule for that. I think getting to that point of being able to engage the system dynamically is a, maybe a bit of a, a jump. I know, you know, as I've been getting into all this process and I'm a little bit, a few years into it now, but I remember the idea of like, oh, I got my test and I, this number's wrong. I want to get this number right. And then I want it to sit there and just be, it'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll have it fixed, right? This whole concept of static perfection. Yeah. It's, it's kind of aesthetic system. of the life. Yeah, well, we started before, <laughs> In the last year and a half, we started pulling monthly soil samples from all of our plots. Mm -hmm. like there would be like 35 samples that were deposited, right? 35 composite samples. So we had 35 individual samples that worked to get the 35. Jeez. Anyway, monthly soil analysis was very eye-opening because it is so dynamic. You can see the water come, you can see the water go away, you can see the temperature influence, you can see, you know, and I, and I can spend a career analyzing that data. You know, just right now, but all the take home message was what a dynamic system, you know, what are we going to learn yet? My goodness. And I'll, yeah, I'll give you a quick, a quick result. So we, so our soil is heavy clay, pH 8.2. Wow. We don't put any phosphate down. So that doesn't make any sense because when you extract our soil, you use phosphate on the plants figure out a way to do it so we were pulling samples and we had wheat growing out there and the wheat had headed out was starting to fill and we 
went out there and so the samples that were had weed in them had was two part per million phosphorus in our, in our extract. We were getting 30 and 40. It's like, oh, well, the machine screwed up. We, this can't be right. So we ran them again, got the same result. We went back out through the same place, pulled more samples, got the same result. Well, guess what it was? It was all those organic acids that those plant roots were dumping out to gather the phosphorus to grow that weed head. Yep. There it was, damn near in real time, right in front of me. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And now, a month later, we'd have gone out there and it'd been five part per million again. But it, that, that showed me that nature has will find a way to get what it needs if we just get out of the way. Support it in actually flourishing and create the dynamics where it can. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That was a, that was. A, there's a whole bunch of stuff in my career that I'll I'll just never forget like that. It just they just jumped out at me and I, it, I you know I wasn't looking for it. I was smart enough to know what to ask but yeah there it was great um <clears throat> let me see uh lorna asks what mix do you recommend for cover crops do you have <laughs> do you <laughs> to the same point uh leave the cover crops in for a full season to get the benefits that's a good one that and again that's going to be one that is your area right based on where you live Yep. The cover crops that I use won't be the ones you use if you live in Nebraska or Wyoming or whatever. But some of the latest research I did before I'm about to retire was looking at that, doing that thing I to told you about. Here's my advice. I'm, I'm not going to do a long-winded thing. Plant a bunch of different micro uh, cover crops in some small area on your garden or farm or wherever and go out there and pull those, and pull those individual cover crops pull them out of the ground, shake the dirt off, put it in a bag, pull enough of them to get a sample and send it to a lab that does this test. And that will tell you which cover crops your soil on. I've done this. Did everybody get that? It worked. <laughs> the only really way to know what your, which cover crops are appropriate for your soil is to actually grow them Ask your soil. in your soil and see you know, which ones have the best effect. Um, so we we tried for ten years to come up with a mix until I figured that out. Yeah, we tried ten years of mixes, and then I did that. And it was like, oh my god, it's been this all along. And sure enough, it's like saying that there's this is the this is the diet that's appropriate for every person in the country, yep. right? I mean, it's just in principle, it's a it's a fallacious thought. We still presume to proceed forward with it. Right. It's, it's remarkable, but. Um, I think that's a great that's a great answer. Um, it, it works. I, I, it, it works. Yeah, which does require a certain amount of, you know, um, thought and process. And then when you get into polycultures, mixes of six or five different eight, eight different things, then it gets even more complicated. But I guess you could see which ones have the better effect. Even well, we we worked with uh, green cover seeds, and and they had we analyzed fifty some samples, uh, and some were mixes some were monoculture cover crops and it, it was it was fascinating it was just fascinating and i believe you told me maybe it was that test that when you were seeing which which uh had the best effect it was sunflowers by themselves was that yeah and the one i did yeah at us yeah yeah our our partner loved sunflowers loved so all the different mixes this eight-way mix this 12-way mix and your soil sunflowers by themselves had a better positive more positive effect than any of the other mixes. Is that is that a fair yeah. characterization of what yeah, you said? Yeah, it is. That is fair. Yep. So now, just to open people's minds to the nuance of how it all works. Yeah. I I like the mixed species cover crops because you get the diversity of of, of interaction yeah. of microorganisms. Uh, I wouldn't just plant sunflowers, but your soil will tell you. So my advice is is on a small area, plant forty, yeah, different cover crops species in it you know and pull them and get them analyzed get that soil analyzed around that root when they get up you know that tall pull them out shake the dirt off them and and your soil will tell you i like this i don't like that i like this i don't like that i mean i'm a fan of let's ask the soil what we can do for it <laughs> not well, let's go do this and like you do for us. take it yeah. <laughs> beautiful um all right um, uh, Lorna asks, um, I thought I remember John Kemp saying that it is detrimental to let the soil dry out 
I can't remember the technical reason, but that it took quite a few days or so for plants to get back to where they were. I've heard John say that things like potassium availability drop off dramatically when the soil dries out, and it takes at least 30 days for that availability to come back. Um, I guess what's the definition of dry out? Yeah, exactly. Well, when I was a grad student, you know, they would say, well, you have to use field moist soil. And I'm just a dumb farm boy, naive. And I said, explain to me what a field moist soil is. Yeah. Is that 2% moisture, 40% moisture? You know, it, I got to hit with that right away. It's like, what? What does that even mean? I, I don't. I don't know what that means. John's a lot smarter than my. I'd go with whatever John says over me any day. Is that answer that? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a good way not to answer the question. <laughs> no, soil's just soil drying and rewetting. And when I say drying and rewetting, I mean, you know, soils will dry out that maybe that deep, right? And things will start to go a little bit south. But if you go down here, this is still kind of wet. Now. I think what John might be talking about, if you if you get pretty droughty where you're down there four, five, six inches and it's dry, yeah. now you got some problems. And we saw that in the drought here years ago, which by the way, was really funny. In Texas, we had a big drought and it really didn't make the national news. As soon as the Midwest had, you know, just a couple inches short, it was, you know, all gonna die. So that, that was kind of a fun thing, but, but uh, I think we're talking about the depth of dryness because at night also, most people don't get in about this is that, you know, at night you got the soil profile and when it cools off, you know, there's capillary actions because you have subsoil moisture and it comes up at night. And that's why you'll see things look green and pretty at, at night because you get water moved back up. Even after the plants pull it down, it comes back up. That happens over and over. We saw that in the drought because it would rain and things would look good for a while and then it would go right back to not to, to doing poorly because the subsoil moisture it was so dry for so long it dried that soil so deep it took forever to get it back functioning like it was supposed to i i, I have always, always say that as i understand it you know the tidal force is actually operational not only on the oceans but on land as well and that gravity you know gravitational pull of that affects water of the sun and the moon is literally raising and lowering water in this soil profile on a daily basis. A couple of times. It happens. I've seen it. Yeah. And so as long as you've got a reasonable, you know, um, water table uh, and you don't have a, a big, you know, plow pan, um, yeah. that should be able to be occurring. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, Rolf uh, says, hi, Dan, I'm very impressed with Rick's presentation. Do we need to send over samples to the USA or is there a lab doing the tests in Europe or better than Netherlands? Would you reach to do assist setting up a lab for the Haney tests? In <laughs> I would probably assist. Yeah, I, I would well, like the kind of guy who can actually make things done, get things done. I'd so like to see uh, the test yeah. more widely. I get a lot of calls from overseas and wanting to do this and it like, you know, I'm biased. I, I'm human. I, I really like the test, not because I developed it, but because I, I do believe it's the best that we have right now that actually tries to mimic nature. And there, there's there's a lot of potential saving for fertilizer use out there. I'm not anti-fertilizer. I'm anti-too much fertilizer. I, yeah. Let's give them the right amount, and this test will help get us there. Uh, right now, uh, U.S. is the only game for this test, but that can change. Um, well, Rolf, I'm happy to help coordinate that connection if it uh, sounds like he's open to it. Um, great. Um, <clears throat> uh, Saverio asks, when you use cover cropping, can I let it go to seed? Yes. I do. Yeah. And even you can harvest the seed and call it a crop. Well, see, I think there's a huge <laughs> market being lost because yeah. if I was farming in this day and age, my buddy I'm staying with here, who's just turned 76, if I was him, I'd start growing cover crop. Because instead of selling wheat by the bushel, let's sell cover crop seed by the pound. Seriously. I'm, I am serious. I'm dead serious. Because No, absolutely. Absolutely. And it, we're going to, this deal's going to keep going. And we're going to, you're already seeing it. These these seed deals are running out of cover crop seed. Very That's what I think. <laughs> it's, it's actually... So, Totally. <laughs> yeah. I, 
it's just a cool thing to do too. Uh, okay, I've got another another question from Rolf. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the presence of specific levels of main and trace elements for plant and soil health. Apparently, you do not find that so important. The diversity of plant species is to safeguard the diversity in minerals. That's why we stress on the diversity in plants, shrubs, and if possible, trees. Yep. I don't hear a question there, but. Well, but I, I think the point is that like organic matter is a fine measurement. And if you think about what organic matter is, it took NPK, carbon, micronutrients, all that stuff to make organic matter in the first place, didn't it? So if you've got good organic matter levels, you would hope that you have decent micro, micronutrient levels, right? You would, that's uh, not always gonna be the case, but you would think, you know, that it should be sufficient. Now, did I prove that on every soil? No, I can't. Well, I think, I mean, I think Ross talking about the stuff that John Kemp's been doing with the plant sap analysis, and I'm guessing looking at those kind of ratios and saying, you know, I mean, I think we can understand that in some soils, you simply don't have enough boron or enough, enough yeah sulfur um and that is a limiting factor um but it's yeah and then we go to the question of what are we producing is it volume or is it quality so well that's, that's all, all these yeah, questions glad, all over overlap i'm glad you said that because that's what i was about to say because yeah it might be limiting something might be limiting right maybe it's supposed to be limiting maybe something you know what i mean i mean for example, I watched this uh, documentary the other day, and these, these scientists were saying that uh, Rubisco enzyme that pulls CO2 from the air messes up and gets an oxygen every now and again. So they said, you know, nature's screwing up. It's not efficient. And what popped into my mind right away is, how do you know that's not exactly what it should be doing? Yeah. And then they later admitted in the documentary that when it gets oxygen every now and again, it actually act as a regulator on photosynthesis so you don't have run away you know it's like huh but they didn't see that 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 went right like that yeah so nope, nope nature's inefficient i say i don't believe that i think <laughs> it's it's ahead of us yeah yeah no it's a it's a i mean i don't think we're gonna run out of things to study <laughs> and understand no. Um, no. anytime soon all right um got one from sherry here um in colorado we're primarily reliant on city irrigation to keep our gardens alive how much does chlorination of the water affect the biology of the soil? And is there a suggested way to adjust for this? Good question. Uh, yeah, microbes don't like chlorine at all. Uh, that's what kills them, as we all know. That's but, why they put it in the water. <laughs> but yeah, but it depends on the levels. If, if, they're, if they're pretty small, we did a study years ago in, when I was in grad school with atrazine, which is chlorinated and the microbes, it knocked them back. You know, atrazine is a herbicide that lasts a long time in soil because it's resistant, because the microbes don't like it because of chlorine, and, but they overcome it. But the levels are low enough. If they're, if, you know, if, if chlorine is like a part per million or two, it, I, I don't think you, you're going to have a problem with that. But it's an interesting question. Uh, and if it is at a high level, I think generally what I suggest is some sort of a you know, a, a stable carbon buffer like liquid humates or or biochar powder or something. Yeah, so it's sort of kind of chelating effect, yeah. Which will tie it up effectively, make yep. it unavailable, yeah. Another one from Roizen, uh, curious if the nutrition profile of plants deliberately water stressed and those not are different. Does that mean that deliberately stressing should be in our toolbox for growing nutrient dense foods? <laughs> He's already above me. I don't, I don't even know how to answer it. Let's experiment. That's I mean, we exactly don't know. Right. We don't even know what nutrient density is yet, right? And we haven't defined the variation of quality and the spectrum. No, of but you know what? We we all, but every one of us know what what we as animals, like. not as scientists. Like. Yeah, we like. Yeah, you, you, here's your uh, nutrient density indicator right for right now. Yeah, how's it taste? You're hardwired with a couple of really sophisticated nutrient assessment. That's yeah, true. Meters. So fair enough. Rosen, test it and see how they taste. That's what people say about tomatoes, right? If, if, you, if you water it them too much, they don't taste very good. So, I mean, there's definitely um, there's definitely insight to be to be integrated there. Oh, I, I think the little bit of a stress. I watched that for you know 20 years. I worked for those guys off and on. If this week we all that year in and year out when it when it was stressed a little bit, it came back stronger. If you put too much fertilizer out, 
it you know See, it, it, this, it, but we have to define stress so i would never consider putting nitrogen into a field because like i mean as i understand it it's i mean it shouldn't be necessary so if you're up if you have a reasonably functioning soil like it's only going to be counterproductive and so when people say stress your plants they mean in many cases like give them less fertilizer and i'm like but that's oh, not yeah. stressing them that's actually uh, really that yeah. where they're flourishing so you know how do you define stress i would say putting a lot of soluble nutrients under the system is profoundly stressing the system and that's going to correlate with lower nutrient levels so that's just a my personal no i get yeah. comment on that fair point. but people but think that stress thing out there around and i'm like what what do you mean by stress well but i think the question that i i kind of misled everybody i mean you know, we let our gardens, what I call stress a little bit. It's like, you know, it'll start to wilt a little bit. You'll see some of this, you yeah. know, because of the heat stuff. And we'll, we'll let that go for a couple of days and yeah. then water. We don't panic water. Right. It's like, oh, my God, it, it wilted a little bit. Let's go, you know. Right. No, let, that's that's not how nat nature functions. I mean, it doesn't function. It doesn't <laughs> panic water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We do. We got, we got, Four minutes left, and and I'm, I've only got a couple of questions left, but let's, I'm not sure we're going to get them all. Um, um, mycorrhizae and plant roots have a variety of ways of extracting nutrients. Oh, I, I already asked that one. Um, have you tested soils treated with basalt dust, paramagnetic, versus not treated? Uh, not to my knowledge. Not to your knowledge. Um, let me see. Uh, Lorna says, um, oh, oh, this is Bill and Jay's response to Lorna. Gabe Brown and others find more diversity, eight or more species in cover crop is key. What species depends on what time of year. I guess that was more of a comment than a question. Um, we did a we did a study, uh, mono cultures, cover crops versus mixed species side by side, replicated. Yeah, It was night and day. The multi-species outperformed uh, the single species across the board on my test. Except for this sunflowers thing you were telling me well but the sunflower was it was a different thing by itself this was this was typical cover crop uh species mixes versus uh just a single species i think we're using rye or something something that's real popular yeah anyway <laughs> I there's, love no, there's no there's no there's no easy answers <laughs> no. all right we'll get one last question here and then maybe if you have any final moments of, of insight or, or comments uh, Ryan asks, how do you see our knowledge of microbial roles and strain specific roles in the soil affecting our testing methods of mineral nutrient density, et cetera? So I guess that, that would be about the uh, functional groups. Um, different microbial communities have different functional capacities. Um, does that affect, I mean, I think that would correlate to the effect of increased nutrient density when those are more present. Yes, I would think so. Now, the DNA testing and stuff in soil is great. I think it's awesome. It's future, but there's a whole lot of stuff being said about things that we don't really know yet. And we're, you know, I'll never forget I had this conversation with this guy who's a, who's a some university and he was a DNA guy. And, and I said, do you have to use uh, AI to uh, analyze the data coming off the machine? He said, well, yeah. And I said, why? He said, because it's so massive, no human, can, there's so too much information. And I asked him, I said, well, he, he's like, do you have an AI program? I said, no, I, we use BI. He's like, what's BI? I said, biological intelligence. And he, he was, it's not artificial, it's biological. It's my brain. Yeah. It's Use yours. In, intuition, common sense, experience oh, in literature. I'm going to launch this on you. Are you ready? This is you your list. Uncommon sense. Uh-huh. Think about that for a minute. Because somebody asked me the other day, and I said, no, I use uncommon sense to understand this. It's like, well, why, everybody's got common sense. I said, yeah, that's why I use uncommon sense. <clears throat> so, Presumptuous, fun. but that's fine. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure, Rick. It's uh, wonderful having you, and congratulations on a, a successful career, I'm assuming. And um, like I said, yeah. you know, I, you know, I kept hearing about this Haney test and, the, and I just assumed Haney was somebody from history, like, you know, and then he was, lo, lo and behold, he's alive and feisty and, and oh, weird. Uh, yeah, no, and great. It's wonderful. I, I look forward to what you uh, bring forth um, in the future. It seems yeah, like we're not done yet. No, I, you. You are. I think you got a lot left in you and I, it's really, it's really exciting and I appreciate all the work you've done so far. So um, thank you.
All right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Great. Be well all.